What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly updates. There's lots of exciting news to go over here this week, lots of big reveals. And uh, so the first one here right off the bat is Nissan has revealed the 2022 Frontier. So it's been long awaited for an all new version. And so this new uh, Frontier does have an all new body and interior, but it stays on the same platform as before, although it has been significantly updated. And I'll get more to that in a second. But first, the looks here, I think they're really fantastic. Uh, it's this rugged and modern look without copying any of the others too much. I know some people think it reminds them of the Tacoma. I can see a, maybe a little bit of a similarity towards the rear and stuff, but I think the front is very distinctive and looks really nice. I mean, it's a pickup truck after all. There's only so much differentiation you can do, but um, I think it looks really good overall. And uh, even though the wheelbase is the same, the truck is now five inches longer than before with uh, most of that length added up front there to give it a bolder front end. Um, there's also gonna be a long wheelbase version still offered, and you can still either get a king cab or a crew cab as well. Engine-wise, the only option is the new 3.8 liter V6 engine that was introduced last year. Uh, that's nationally aspirated. It does 310 horsepower and 281 pound-feet of torque. There's no four-cylinder for this generation because they say that there's very little demand for it. There is also no manual transmission for this generation either probably for the same reason, or at least that's what they'll claim. So, you know, you still have just basically, I think the Tacoma is the last one to still have a manual. So um, kind of crazy, but uh, so yeah, there's that. All Frontiers are gonna be using the nine speed automatic from the Titan though. Um, so at least it's a normal automatic and stuff. So that's good. It's rated to tow less than most of its competitors though at 6,720 pounds for its max tow rating. And then this Pro 4X version you're looking at will actually do even less uh, because those max ratings come from the base and the mid grade SV rearable drive trims. Suspension wise, there's new stabilizer bars and new down stampers. Um, they emphasize though that this updated frame has many updates, uh, including a hydraulic cabin mounts that have been redone in the rear that they claim will reduce road vibrations by 80%. They also improved the crash performance of the frame as well so that hopefully it will perform better than the subpar ratings that the old truck got for its small overlap crash test. Um, it was not pretty, but again, most cars that are that old aren't very pretty so um, you know I think hopefully they're going to um, improve that uh, although the new Titan was just crash tested this week and it actually did worse than the uh, pre-refresh version so hopefully Nissan actually made some good changes um, that actually do improve those ratings we'll have to wait and see till the actual tests are done as far as other safety stuff goes though, it gets all the newest safety tech except for Nissan's Pro Pilot Assist system. It doesn't get that system because the Frontier still is going to be using hydraulic steering instead of the electric power steering that's needed for that Pro Pilot Assist system. Uh, the inside is similar to the Titan, uh, but it's a huge improvement over the old ancient interior of the old Frontier. You get an 8 inch touchscreen as standard with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and a 9 inch screen is optional, which actually makes it I think the largest screen you can get in this segment of vehicle. Um, just just out ahead of the 8.4 inch screen in the Gladiator, I guess. Um, and so yeah, good that they have uh, you know some pretty competitive stuff there. There's going to be four trims available: SSV Pro X, which is rear-wheel drive, and then Pro 4X, which is uh, four-wheel drive. And so that Pro 4X version gets Bilstein shock absorbers, skid plates, tow hooks, all-terrain tires, electronic locking diff, and uh, the sportier looks and the red accents and stuff you see. And then the rear-wheel drive Pro X version gets basically every everything except that uh, locking diff, of course, and the skid plates, um, but it seems to get all the other stuff too, so that's nice. And um, yeah, I think it's a really nice redo, and it's going to be on sale this summer, but we don't have any pricing for it yet, so we'll have to wait and see you know, how they actually ended up doing the pricing on it. Also, along with that reveal, Nissan has revealed the 2022 Pathfinder. Um, and so like the Frontier, the Nissan Pathfinder here uses the same platform as the old Pathfinder, but they did make extensive updates to it again. But that does mean it still is unibody. Um, so those that were hoping for it to be a body on frame thing um, are going to be upset. But uh, the front end design does look very similar to the body on frame Armada though, um, you know, with very squared off looks and stuff that I think look really nice. And the rest of the sheet metal is entirely new as well. Um, and the sides in the back are very distinctive too. I really like that floating C pillar design. Pathfinder badging on the back seems a little bit large in my opinion. Uh, but other than that, I think it looks really 
really nice. Otherwise, on the inside, it gets um, all new stuff as well. So you get uh, much of the same stuff you get in the new Rogue, uh, but that's a good thing. So you get the optional nine inch screen there, um, fully digital gauges, big head up display on the top trim. Um, so all that kind of stuff is really nice. Although that nine inch screen does give you wireless Apple CarPlay, but still makes you do wired Android Auto, unfortunately. The eight inch screen, it's all wired in. So it's not wireless like some of the competitors are for everything across the board. Um, it's seats eight, but there is now going to be a seven passenger configuration with captain's chairs available for the first time in the Pathfinder. Cargo space is slightly better than before with the third row up, they say, but I'm wondering if using the same platform as before kind of limited how big they could make it because you would think that they would want it to be, you know, as big as possible for this segment to properly compete with the Telluride, the Palisade, stuff like that. But it sounds like the um, trunk space and stuff is a tiny bit smaller than what you get with a lot of the other competitors. Um, and I'm guessing that also might extend to some of the other parts of the interior. We'll have to wait till I can actually review one and kind of crawl all over it and see how it compares. But, um, you know, hopefully it, uh, it has enough here to, uh, you know, be worthy of you know competing with all those others out there that are a little bit bigger and stuff. Um, and one thing that will be very competitive though is the safety tech because it gets the best that Nissan has, including that very good Pro Pilot Assist system, um, which should make it one of the nicest to road trip in this segment. Because if they have some of the best steering assist, um, that would kind of put it above most of the other stuff out there and be a really nice touch. Mechanically, it uses the same old three and a half liter V6, the old motor, not the new one from the Frontier. So unfortunately, it only does 284 horsepower and 259 pound-feet of torque. I'm not sure why they didn't put the new motor in from the Frontier, but anyway, thankfully though, that one thing they did change is the CVT is finally gone from the Pathfinder and they've now swapped in the ZF nine-speed automatic as instead. So uh, that's a nice uh, change there. Hopefully that helps a lot of people since I know the f anytime I say the word Nissan, the first thing out of half the people's mouths is CVT. So hopefully at least they, you know, they don't have to worry about a CVT here in the Pathfinder. Um, front wheel drive is going to be standard. All wheel drive is optional. Um, it's a new all wheel drive system as well that uh, they say has direct coupling now and can send power to the back even without the front wheels detecting any slippage. So they can send up to 50% of the power to the rear and uh, you know is a little bit quicker to react there. It also can tow 6,000 pounds, which does make it one of the better towers in its segment of vehicles. So that is one little edge that it has. Uh, there wasn't much info given about the suspension aside from the ground clearance uh, being increased by 0.2 inches, but they claim that its new electric power steering system does give it more agile handling. I'll have to wait and test that out for myself here, hopefully sometime um, this year. But uh, uh, there's no pricing for this one either, but it also goes on sale this summer. So interesting to see that as well. And the last little bit of Nissan news here briefly is that they announced this week that um, they want to electrify every all new car it launches by the early 2030s. So let's unpack that here. So, um, you know, they say electrify, so we're not talking about everything being fully EV. That could be something as simple as a mild hybrid setup, which is basically what you get with like the e-torque system and the Rams and stuff and the mild hybrid stuff all the Germans do already. So it could be that, it could be more, um, but it doesn't mean it's gonna be all fully electric. And also they say that it's gonna be every all new car. So saying every all new car by sometime in the 2030s is still a very vague goal. And that could mean that if you know the new Nissan GTR, for example, comes out in 2029, you know, then that would not have any kind of electrification that would dodge that thing. So even by the 2030s, it could continue on without electrification if they decided to do that. We'll have to wait and see who knows when a new GTR is coming, by the way. I know a lot of people still ask. We have no clue. Um, I'm just excited that hopefully a new Nissan Z is coming here relatively soon, um, but the GTR might be a long ways off. So, but anyway, interesting to hear all that Nissan news. But speaking of electrification goals, GM also had a very bold statement this week, um, and this past week actually, they said that um, they're planning to make all their new light duty vehicles fully electric by 2035. So they're, you know, being more specific here, saying fully electric and also light duty stuff. So we're not, not talking about anything that's, you know, heavy duty trucks and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, like I say with any other big far off goal that these companies have, a lot can change in the next 14 years to either speed up that rollout or slow it down, depending on, you know, how things go in the next 14 years. That's a long ways off. Um, so we'll have to see if they do hit those targets or what ends up happening with all that. Um, but at least if you're a GM fan, you know that the writing is on the wall here. You know, you have 14 more years to buy brand new gas burning GM performance vehicles. Um, and so, you know, that kind of tells you that 
you know, the new Camaro is most likely going to be electric if they do something like that. Um, you know, and I'm sure down the road, of course, obviously Corvette will have to go fully electric as well. So all those types of things are going to be radically changing here. And so we should enjoy them while we have them. Speaking of awesome gas burning GM performance cars that we should definitely enjoy, Cadillac this week has revealed the 2022 CT5 V Blackwing and CT4 V Blackwing. So first let's talk about the CT5 V. It runs a 6.2 liter supercharged V8 like the old CTS V did, but it gets a unique supercharger, unique throttle body, and unique exhaust along with stronger heads to up the power to 668 horsepower and 659 pound-feet of torque. So those are improvements of 28 horsepower and 29 pound-feet of torque over the old CTS-V. The engine is also now hand built by a single builder in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and it's going to be signed with uh, their signature and stuff, which is really cool. It'll do a 3.7 seconds 0 to 60 with a 10 speed 10L90 automatic that's going to be available, but a six speed manual is standard, and it's awesome that they're bringing the manual back because even the current gen CTS V did not have any kind of manual. You have to go back to the prior generation of the CTS V for the last manual that they offered. So that's a really big deal. The manual is also really nice. It gets auto rev matching, no lift shifting, and it's a dual disc clutch, but they say it still, you know, isn't too heavy or anything, but it has to obviously handle, you know, over 650 horsepower. Um, top speed is over 200 miles per hour, they say. It also gets extra coolers, round out the package, and you also get the largest brakes ever put on a Cadillac with optional carbon ceramic brakes that are Brembo six pistons in the front and four pistons in the rear. The fourth generation of magnetic ride control is also standard, and it's four times faster than the old system. Uh, there's also an electronic limited slip diff to help manage all that power. Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires that are customized specifically for the Cadillacs also try their best to grip with 275s in the front and 305s in the rear for the CT5V. And if you want to roast those tires, there's now a new line lock feature that will help you do that as well. To make room for these tires, the fenders are wider to give the Black Wings a more aggressive stance, even though the change is subtle. I know a lot of people were complaining that it doesn't look aggressive enough, and yeah, they could have done something really wild or done some very obvious fender flares like Dodge does, but it is going to be wider. I think this is one of those cars you're going to have to see in person to really get the presence of that extra width and stuff. I think it doesn't really come out on camera very much, but um, I'm excited. I think it's going to look great. There's also uh, functional fender vents uh, or another change here for the Black Wings. There's also standard forged wheels, which will be available in a couple of different styles and colors, including black polished and even bronze wheels you can get, which will be cool. Uh, there's two different carbon fiber packs that are available as well that add on splitters, spoilers, and even canards uh, that can be removed and those pieces are wind tunnel tested and reduce lift by 75% on the CT5 and by 214% on the CT4 with those equipped. Uh, speaking of that CT4V Blackwing, it gets many of the same improvements as far as handling goes, although the brakes are a little bit smaller. Uh, but power-wise, the CT4 uses the same engine as the ATS-V, meaning it's a 3.6 liter twin turbo V6 that's built in Canada, but it does get improved induction, new turbo compressors, a new exhaust, tune, oil squirters, and even titanium connecting rods in the manual transmission versions. And so all this doesn't boost the power that much though, coming in at 472 horsepower and 445 pound-feet of torque. Uh, so that means you get eight more horsepower and no additional torque. Uh, kind of a little bit of a surprise there, but um, I mean, it still is a healthy amount of power. You know, that's basically, you know, what that model is kind of designed to compete with stuff like the M3, even though it's priced way less than an M3. You know, it's that same manual, you know, twin turbo V6 type thing. I think, you know, that's kind of what they're going for there. And that puts it right in the same horsepower you get with the M3 with the manual version. So I don't think the power is inadequate. Um, and I'm sure the power curve is also improved on that model. Um, but anyway, so moving on here, it also comes standard with that manual transmission, but a 10 speed automatic, the 10L80 is gonna be available as well. It'll do zero to 60 only 0.1 seconds slower than the CT5V Blackwing at 3.8 seconds, um, which shows you just how traction limited that CT5 is. If the CT5 V Blackwing could actually hook up, I mean, it'd probably be way faster. Um, you know, so this thing's got, the CT4 has got like 200 less horsepower and it's basically keeping up with the other one until beyond 60. Of course, you know, zero to 60 times only show a partial bit of that performance and what it actually can do 
beyond 60, the CT5V is going to just obliterate the uh, CT4V Blackwing. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, the C zero to 60 time does not tell that full story. The CT5V is going to be an impressive beast, I'm sure. Top speed for that CT4, though, is 189 miles per hour, so still very impressive. The interiors on both cars are fairly similar to the regular V versions, but they do get some nice improvements here, like some sportier seats that still do have heating, cooling, and massage. Uh, there's a sportier steering wheel that has a V button and a PTM switch, which is very cool. A little bit of a Ferrari kind of reminder to me as far as how that switch is. That's very cool. There's also 12-inch uh, digital gauges with lots of, lots of performance customizations as well. You can get a carbon fiber back seat with microfiber as well if you'd like. Um, and, you know, a couple other things, carbon fiber trim, all that kind of stuff is optional. And so pricing for the CT5 V starts at $84,990, including destination. So 85 grand and then the uh, ct4v blackwing starts at fifty nine thousand nine hundred ninety dollars including its destination so 60 grand for the blackwing ct4 and 85 for the ct5 i think both are very reasonably priced for the kind of performance you're getting here i mean yes they don't have all-wheel drive like you can get in most of their competitors aside from that I think that these things are awesome. And honestly, I was expecting the CT5V Blackwing, since it's going to be kind of limited, I thought that that would be going for more money than it actually is. Because that's basically the same kind of starting price you got with the CTSV, and you have more power, a way nicer interior than the CTSV and stuff. I'm very impressed with their pricing. I think they really priced these well. And so the first 250 of each, um, it seems like all the people that are Cadillac fans agree with the pricing, because uh, the first 250 of each were available to reserve, um, and they were sold out within minutes of that reservation opening up. So um, those are all gone. Cadillac did say they will build as much as they can. I was actually on a conference call with Cadillac um, whenever they revealed this um, and they said they will build as many as they can build. So they're not artificially limiting this at all. We're only doing 1,000 of them and then never anymore. You know, they're going to try and do as many as they can. But they say, they did note that supply is somewhat limited. So there's only so many of those engines they can churn out or whatever the case might be. So, you know, it's not an unlimited amount that they can build, but I think, you know, hopefully they will build as many as are ordered, hopefully. And they did say you can be on a wait list with your dealer whenever more allocations do open up. Um, so not sure how limited it'll be just yet, but hopefully they'll continue to build these for several years and, um, you know, build a ton of them. And hopefully lots of people continue to buy them. I'm very excited to uh, review these here, hopefully this summer, because they say deliveries will be starting towards the end of this summer. So um, I am super excited for these. And I think if I were wanting to buy a super sedan, that CT5V Blackwing would be my choice. Just simply because you have a supercharged V8, not you know turbo V8s like everything else. So it'll sound way cooler and a manual transmission. And I just love the CT5. I was really impressed with the regular V version. Um, so I'm very excited for these. So awesome to see that. And Ford this week has revealed the 2021 Raptor finally. And so they did reveal it, but they didn't reveal the V8 version. They confirmed that a V8 version is coming and they revealed it'll be called the Raptor R. So we do know that. But uh, supposedly it's not going to be coming until next year, and we have no info on it other than the fact it's going to be V8 powered. So in the meantime, we have the normal Raptor here for 2021. So this 2021 model, um, they're not even confirming powertrain details for it either, which is bizarre because I mean it's a 2021 model year that's going to be, you know, they're going to have to switch over to 2022s here, um, you know, probably in six months or something. So I mean it's not really a very long model year, and the fact they're still holding back their Power numbers is weird. But anyway, so they say it's a high output version of the three and a half liter EcoBoost V6. Um, and maybe the same exact power as before, or it might be slightly more. We'll have to wait and see. But either way, it's likely that nobody's going to be too excited about the engine. But there is um, a new active exhaust, so that is one little change. But uh, the biggest news here is the completely new rear suspension. So it's a five link coil spring suspension with Fox live valve internal bypass shocks, a pan hard rod, and extra long trailing arms. The frame gets beefed up with reinforcements to account for this uh, suspension changes as well. And so this should all translate to a big improvement on ride quality and handling. It also helps when off-roading, of course, and on the smaller 35-inch tires, uh, the suspension travel is 14 inches in the front, 15 inches in the rear. That goes down by about an inch on the optional 37-inch tires. Um, and 37-inch tire Raptors also get even tougher versions of those Fox shocks to help work with that, uh, you know, the extra tire and stuff. And so you get 12 inches of ground clearance as standard 
standard, but you get 13.1 inches on those 37s. Styling-wise, the grille and the hood are unique, which means you won't be able to swap a Raptor grille onto a regular F-150 without swapping the hood as well, and maybe even the fenders, I'm not sure, but it's not going to be as easy as it used to be. Um, and the wider fenders are unique, of course. They're both in the front and the back. Tailgate, all that kind of stuff. Looks really good, you know, still very much Raptor, you know, nothing too different from the norm, but I think it looks really cool. And I'm happy to see that the color orange is making a return here. Reminds me of the first generation Raptor. On the inside though, it gets a unique steering wheel with suede accents and you get unique seats, which sadly, although they do have a more aggressive bolstering, that means that they do not get the fold flat front seat feature that other 2021 F-150s get. And uh, you also lose the massage function. Um, first board problems, but yeah, so you're not gonna be able to get that. So uh, most of the other features though and options that you can get on the new F-150s like the generator and stuff, that is also gonna be available on the new Raptor, so that's cool. And so there's not any pricing for these yet, but they'll start arriving in dealers late this summer. So interesting to see that should be kind of arriving around the same time as the Broncos, most likely. Moving on to some other little shorter stories here. Lexus this week has teased a new concept car they'll be showing this spring that illustrates their intentions for the future and marks the beginning of the next generation of Lexus. So we can see Lexus is spelled out in a different font and we're seeing we're seeing the back end of some vehicle. Um, it's a very bold styling design there for the rear window and stuff. So I'm sure it's just a concept, but they did mention that they are going to have a new model coming out this year. So we'll have to wait and see on all that. But interesting to get that little teaser and we'll have to wait till this spring for the full reveal of that concept. Australian magazine Go Auto interviewed Jeep's global president this week and asked him about whether the Gladiator would be electrified, which, I mean, I, we all kind of assumed it would get all the same stuff as the Wrangler, including the 4XE powertrain. And um, so the global president's answer was for sure about it getting electrified and said the most logical uh, conclusion you know, I think that he didn't admit to this, but everyone's assuming it's going to be that 4XE powertrain since it's the same thing you get in the Wrangler. And, you know, most of the stuff in the Wrangler bolts right up to a Gladiator and vice versa, I think. So I'm pretty sure they're able to swap that over without too much trouble. So uh, count on there being a 4XE version of the Gladiator, most likely at some point here this year. So we'll have to wait and see, you know, if that actually happens. But I think it's pretty much a foregone conclusion at this point. Um, we have some new Genesis stories this week here. So the GV80 Club uh, this week is reporting that an anonymous Genesis insider uh, told them that a coupe model is coming um, for the GV80. So it would still be four doors like all the other SUV coupes that are out there uh, these days, but it would have a more angled windshield and less boxy back end, you know, with swoopier coupe look to compete with all the German coupe SUVs. Not sure how soon that's going to arrive, but... You know, if it is basically a GV80 with a sportier roofline, it shouldn't take them long to do, so I'm sure we'll see it this year. Um, and possibly going along with that news, um, GVForums.com found some South Korean patents for new Genesis names this past week. And so the names all just put an E at the end of every single Genesis model they sell. So um, at least it's nice and easy. You just have an E at the end, you know, okay, that's the electric version and that's it. But this does mean though that they're going to be having, you know, electric versions of the entire Genesis lineup, which is very impressive. And that's something that every other car company is trying to do right now. And uh, Genesis might be the first to actually do it. So um, also and included with those trademark names is GV90E. And so my guess is that's what they're gonna call the GV80 Coupe. You know, there's maybe some rumors that they were gonna do a larger three row crossover called that the GV90 to compete with like the BMW X7, GLS, stuff like that, which is still in the cars. That could happen. Um, but I think a lot of times, you know, like you see with the Audi, they don't call the Q8, that's not a bigger Q7. It's the sportier version of the Q7 is the Q8. Same thing goes X5, X6. So I would think that, you know, GV90 is going to be, you know, the sporty version of the GV80. And, uh, you know, having an electric version of that also makes sense. So interesting to see that. We'll have to see, you know, how quickly those electric models come, but uh, very impressive. Um, another new model uh, we know is coming from Genesis is a G70 wagon. And so thanks to KM Lee, we have some new pictures here of a prototype in camouflage parked in South Korea. So he noted it was a sports package because it has 19 inch wheels on Michelin Pilot Sport 4 tires that were 225 in the front and 255 in the rear. And uh, I'm really glad that they're making a wagon version of the G70. This is an actual reality. Um, but I I really hope they bring it to the States. All the recent reports have said that the wagon will most likely just be a Europe thing, but you know, I don't know, like for crash testing and stuff, couldn't it basically be the same as the coupe or the sedan, I mean, you know, and 
I just I feel like hopefully they would be able to do that and not have to do too many legal hoops to actually bring it here. Um, even if it would be order only or something, I think it would be really cool to offer it, uh, especially if they're going to have a sport package for it and everything else. That would be so sweet and would be really cool and kind of potentially be a little bit of a competitor to the Stinger a little bit. Uh, it might be kind of nice, you know, have one that's, you know, more uh, sporty with its, you know, roof and stuff with the Stinger and then you have the actual more practical wagon with the G70. It could be very cool. Um, so we'll have to see on all that, but huge thanks to KM for providing me with those pictures. Another new model um, that uh, potentially could be coming here from the Hyundai Genesis group is the Apple car. So there's continuing to be reports about, you know, Apple working on a car and them teaming up with Kia potentially to do it. And I've covered that in past weekly updates. So this week we have a new report here by uh, South Korean media outlet DongA.com, which claims the deal would involve Apple investing $3.6 billion into Kia so that they could build the Apple car at Kia's plant in Georgia. So um, that would be huge, and I think that could definitely help convince Kia to be like, okay, we'll build a car for you if you're giving us $3.6 billion. Um, I mean, Apple's got the money, so it doesn't sound far-fetched. Um, they claim that Apple wants to produce 100,000 of their cars starting in uh, 2024, and they want to do that annually, 100,000 cars. Um, and they say, according to this news outlet, uh, they say the deal will be signed February 17th. I don't know if we'll get an announcement on that day or when, um, if this actually is true and going to happen. Um, and there's other reports suggesting that Apple will be using the same new electric platform that Hyundai and Kia are currently developing for their Ionic models. So the Ionic 5, I believe, is actually going to be revealed here in the next few days. Um, and so it's, it's rumored it'll be on that same platform which will be interesting if that's the case. You know, we'll have to see just how much differentiation they do if they use some Kia and Hyundai parts or if it's all Apple from top to bottom aside from that skateboard that they're using for the batteries and the uh, all that stuff. But there was all kinds of talk about Apple using their own batteries and stuff. So this is all still up in the air and 2024 is still a long ways away. So we'll have to see. But if we get an actual deal signed, um, that'll be very, very interesting here in a week or so. So very interesting to hear that. And I also had a few more spy pictures sent in this week from Grady in Detroit, um, who spotted this crossover. And uh, the wheels suggest it's a Buick to me. Um, and the window line actually matches up perfectly with an Encore GX. So um, there doesn't appear to be any kind of indication as far as why this is out testing, because you know the Encore GX just came out last year. So it shouldn't be needing a refresh, although it could be getting the same split headlight design that you're seeing on the new um, Enclave that just debuted last week and stuff. So maybe they're hurrying up and doing a quick little refresh for it. Um, but I did you know, notice there in the pictures, there's not any real exhaust cutouts in the bottom. There is a cutout in the front grill there for some airflow. So I don't know. I probably isn't an electric vehicle, but maybe they're getting an electric uh, you know, Encore, you know, some kind kind of Bolt EUV that's going to be coming out here in about a week or so. You know, maybe a Buick version of that is what we're seeing here. I'm not sure. This could also just be a model for China or something. I have no clue what the deal is here with this, but it's very interesting to see. Let me know what you think it is in the comments below. And huge thanks to Grady for sending in those pictures. Very, very interesting. And the last news this week is something near and dear to my heart. Ford officially confirmed this week that the Bullet Mustang has ended production late last year. So I think it was actually around like December or something they quit building them, but um, it's at least been confirmed now. And so it was well known they would kill off the Bullet. It was only going to be a two-year model run. Um, it was We all knew it was going to be replaced by the Mach 1. So this isn't any kind of surprise. I've been fully expecting them to quit building it. Um, but it's still sad to see it come to an end. You know, it was just... Obviously for me, I have a very personal attachment to it since I own one and I was hoping they would build one for years and years and they finally did. Um, I'm even wearing, this is the same shirt that I wore the day that they revealed the uh, 2019 bullet there at the 2018 Detroit Auto Show. Such an epic day for me. And uh, so it's kind of sad to see this little saga come to an end. Um, over the course of those two model years, it's estimated they made about 8,000 2019s and less than 3,600 2020s. Those numbers aren't exact, but that's uh, the numbers that were floating around in the forums uh, based on registries and what everyone seems to know. So less than 12,000 total, if that's true. Not the most rare vehicle out there, but you know, less than 12,000 models is still, you know, a pretty, pretty rare model, I think. I'm just glad I have mine. I plan to keep it my entire life and uh, I still love it to death. I think it's great. It's going to be almost, it'll be three years this summer I've had it. I still love it. I don't know if they're ever going to do a new one. Um, you know, it's always been kind of up in the air, you know, do people get the bullet thing? Do they not? I mean, I think that this 
new one sold decently well, but there's some big discounts on them after everyone bought the first, you know, 2019s. And so they probably built too many of them, honestly, considering the demand. So they might not be able to justify doing it again in the future. We'll have to see if they do. I mean, they do love doing, you know, special editions of Mustang, so we can stay hopeful. Um, but even if they do do a new one for the S650 in, you know, five years or, you know, 10 years or whenever it is, will it be a manual transmission V8 model? I don't know. Or a naturally aspirated V8 at least. I have no clue. Um, but I'm just happy I have mine. I'm glad they did it for this generation. And I'll be forever grateful to Ford for building my dream car. And uh, I'm, I still love it, like I said. So anyway, that's it for all the news this week, guys. Let me know your thoughts and everything in the comments below. Thank you guys very much for watching. Please continue to stay safe and healthy. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.